So, um, my name is Elizabeth Spott. Um, we've assembled a wonderful panel here today to discuss um, publishing, uh, the ins and outs of that, mainly for students and recent graduates. If you're not one of those books anyway, and you want to use um, additional help, I think, in professional development and matter stage of their career. Uh, so, we have assembled here, and we're going to have a nice little conversation. I'm going to the panelists introduce themselves uh, in order to do themselves justice. So, Hello, I'm Doug Oxford Queen. Uh, I believe I'm on this panel because I run a website called Open Access Archaeology. We have a directory of 200 some journals and places to publish open access in archaeology. So if you're interested in that, check out the website. I'm Teresa Krause. I work for Springer. We publish lots of books and journals in archaeology and many, many, many other subjects. Um, I'm Annalise Corbin. I am um, with the Past Foundation. I'm also the SHA co-publication, the special publications editor, um, and I'm also a co-editor in chief of the Journal of Maritime Archaeology. This part. My name is Carol McDavid. Um, I uh, direct a non-archaeology nonprofit, very nonprofit, the Community <laughs> Archaeology Research Institute. Um, but I, I'll, I think today I probably have my hat on as the co-editor of the Journal of Community Archaeology and Heritage, which is a journal published by Manny Publications. I'm Charles Ewan. I'm a professor at East Carolina University. I'm also the president of the SHA, and uh, I do publish. And <laughs> so, although I don't, I don't handle publications like the other ones. I, I'll, I'll be talking about student publishing and such from the other end of the, of the spectrum. Well, thank you, everyone. So, in addition to being involved in the publishing process, I'm sure you've all we don't have your data, but I'm sure you've all published something. So, you have personal experiences on both ends that we can benefit from. Uh, so, I think panelists, we'll leave it up to you. Is there any specific, we have a list of questions to go through today, but is there anything that's really uh, eating at you that you really want to get out of the right way that you need to discuss first thing? <laughs> Not so much. Okay, well, we can start at the top. So, um, really pretty basic questions. Um, are the ways in which educational institutions can better prepare their students for publishing, both while in school and after graduation? I'm sure there are. <laughs> <laughs> well, since I teach at the university, I'll, I'll, I'll start at this. Um, those of you that are working on your master's thesis, I'll say it's important, but don't. No one's going to read it. They will read it. The, the uh, articles are such that you publish out of your master's thesis. So uh, get your thesis. Don't don't bog down on your thesis. Be perfect. When your chair uh, tells you that it's defendable, then defend it and let's get through the process. Don't have a big fight about whether or not this paragraph stays in or yeah. not, right? Stuart. Yeah, but it's it's really the uh, publications that come out. And, and sit down and talk with your committee as to where it might best go. Uh, really, it's it's finding the right publication. Should it go in historical archaeology or should it go in a, a regional uh, journal like Southeastern Archaeology or should it go in something like the Journal of Field Archaeology? There's a whole slew of, of journals out there and finding the best fit really uh, will, will help. And I, I would also say um, sometimes your um, uh, someone on the committee will say, I'll, I'll be happy to, to co-author my PhD and your author. And I remember being a student going, no, damn it, this is my publication. <laughs> if you've not ever published before, it's nice to have, and, and perhaps you guys uh, look at the submissions. If, you, if there's someone in a junior capacity, you know, saying, yeah, I'm, I'm vouching for this student by being a you know, co-author, uh, it, it works well, I, I think. And so, uh, but the main question is, yeah, so talk, talk to, talk to your faculty. And but I, I think at the uh, at the institutional level, we do need as faculty to, to push you guys to uh, to publish more. It it really is your your ticket to uh, uh, a good a good career. I think one of the other things too, um, having been on both sides of this, so I've had the experience of being a faculty member, and I've also and, and worked with and mentored graduate students. And now on this side. Uh, of the equation now, as you guys finish, and then I start to get you know the various submissions, whether it be a master's thesis or a PhD for co-publications or journal articles, and you know take every opportunity that you have as a student to get experience and exposure in the world of disseminating research, whether that's disseminating. 
giving a conference paper or, or being, being the junior, not even the lead, on somebody else's research and going through the publication process in any form whatsoever is, is a really, really critically important experience for you. Because the fact of the matter is, for most of you, the first time you submit an independent article all on your own to a journal, a jury, a high quality jury journal, you're going to be rejected. Most yeah. likely, right? That's okay. Learn from that experience. It's not the end of the world. It's not about you, right? Um, you know, and keep in mind that you know, in the jury um, situation, the folks that are doing those reviews are doing it for your benefit, right? The spirit in which that review is done is to make the work that you're doing better. So take every advantage that you have to practice that skill. That, that's my. my but that said, I do think that when you get those reviews back. Because I should share them with you, whether anonymous or blind or whichever it is, because it varies from journal to journal. Um, it, most reviewers, I think, if, if it's not a blind review, they they would welcome you know sh t talking to you later on, perhaps, or certainly the editor of the journal. I think ask the questions you need to ask to improve the paper, and I think most people would be willing to say, well, you need to work on this, or this was a little, you know, whatever. But um, and the review will deal with specific matters, but. But I think, uh, I think uh, a lot, most, at most journal letters, I, I, I suspect, I know we are, we're very willing to, to speak candidly with people about what they might do with it, how they might pursue it, that kind of thing. Now, our guidelines are very, very, perhaps too specific. We go into a lot of detail on our guidelines about what we're looking for. Because the Journal of Community Archaeology and Heritage, it's a bit of an odd bird in many ways in the sense that the kind of data we're looking for and the kind of material we're looking for, the kind of insights we're looking for, are oftentimes of secondary importance to some of the more technical journals. But we do want people to look at their, their, their public and community work with the same kind of rigor and to apply the same kinds of questions of why, why do I know what I know? Okay, and, and that's another thing which maybe I'll go into later. But, but uh, we do have that problem with people sort of not, they'll, they'll say things like, um, well, the work that we did here with this community helped, to define, helped them to find a sense of their own identities and appreciation for the past. To which we respond, how do you know that? So there are the same, you know, and most people frequently don't tell us. They just sort of <coughs> say that, and then I say, well, so give us evidence. You know, so people who are trained in, in anthropology know what, know what we mean when we say ethnographic data is fine. You know, in, uh, anecdotal data. So that's that's going down a, 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 a more detail on that's covered in our in our guidelines. But read the guidelines. I think is the main thing, and make sure you're clear on what the journal wants. Don't just send stuff out cold. Read, read their guidelines and read what they say they want, and try to respond to it, and send out a, an introductory note. I mean, you know, say this is the kind of work I'd like to send in. What do you think? And I think most editors will respond hopefully soon. If they don't, they're not doing their job, so. Um, from my perspective, I would hope that uh, universities would focus on publishing ethics. Uh, just because an image appears online doesn't mean you can automatically use it in your paper. Uh, you know, even Wikipedia very often cites its sources for where an image came from or who the image belongs to. Um, you know, it's it's always, everybody's work is based on somebody else's work, so just make sure that you're including that in your citations, in your permissions, in your captions. Uh, you'd be amazed at how even senior people forget to do that and then get into a world of trouble because they didn't include one little line of citation. So I just, that's something that I come across very often, uh, surprisingly often and have to kind of straighten out with authors and editors. So I would just want to hammer that home and hope that you guys are really uh, taking that very seriously. That when you start to publish out there in journals, in blogs, uh, that you are citing your source in images and in text. Uh, I'll go with a little more practical advice and say check out, there's a lot of student journals out there by different departments. Um, some good ones is Assemblage at Sheffield, Postal at York, they're run by students. Um, the peer review can be of interesting quality. Um, but I would say practice, practice, practice. Like, this doesn't need to be your dissertation research. You can write just sort of small articles. It could even just be a term paper that you want to sort of take a little further. And 
do that as a first step. Um, build up your confidence, get reviewed, you know, it'll be sort of reviewed, it'll be reviewed by other students. Quality can, you know, vary, but it'll give you a sort of a taste of what the process is like. You'll get a chance to, you know, get some feedback, see how other people publish, and you get your first sort of paper out there, not something that maybe go on, goes on TV. But do that a couple of times, because I think Postal public it's more of a magazine that publishes quarterly, I believe. Uh, Sheffield Assemblage does yearly. But these sort of smaller journals where it's meant to be students. It's meant to sort of be training wheels to get you out there. Um, I think that should be definitely encouraged, even for undergraduates. Um, I know a lot of people <coughs> just don't try to encourage undergraduates as much. But those are perfect venues um, to sort of get out there and practice. You know what a, a great beginning publication is, and just great on so many levels, is doing a book review for, for us, for sort of our gallery. Um, we're, I used to be the book reviews editor, and, and now I think Julie Shuplitsky is, is our brand new book review editor. And, and she's going to be looking for people to review books. So look at, and, and I think we put them on our, our website, uh, a list of the books that you like to review. And if there's some, something that looks of interest to you, but I'm not an expert. We don't have to be an expert, necessarily. Um, what you do is say, I'd like to review that book. And they send you the book, you get to keep it, you write a review of it, and we give you guidelines to what we want to see in it, and it gets published. So you get a publication and a book. It doesn't get any better. And, and it's, you know, it's not too intimidating. And I'd add also, Google is your friend in this case. Google how to write a review, or how to write a paper. There's, there's books out there, so there's a lot of books. Go to your library, I'm sure they have a whole shelf of how to write, you know, a peer reviewed paper. Um, some of the advice may be more generic, it may not apply to archaeology, but ask around. Like, you don't have to kind of wing it, send it out there, and hope it comes back. Well, you can actually ask for advice on how to write these things. And there's a place on your CV for reviews. Yeah. One of the other places that folks don't think about, but it's also another good place to, to practice and get some experience is um, a lot of um, smaller conferences or regional conferences will produce proceedings. Um, here at um, the SHA conference, underwater papers are eligible to be part of underwater proceedings. Um, that's, that they're done very differently, right? They're not a big jury um, paper. They're based on a talk that you're giving, but they still require that they're written well, that they're citations, that you know that they're fully edited. You know, so again, it's another place to get you know an experience with some of that publishing that's a little lower stakes. It's not such a stressful environment that'll allow you to have that experience. Yeah. How are those? Because I, I have one in the Society for California Archaeology that proceeds uh, uh, last year. How has that looked at compared to like the peer review stuff? I mean, does it really carry much weight at all? It, it is. Well, it's it's a proceedings, and you know, within the profession, not just ours, but broadly, um, you know, proceedings are, are fairly well understood, right? So it's gonna it's gonna fall well below a jury journal article, um, and it may or may not, you know, fall, you know above or below, you know, doing book reviews, it depends on your institution or whatever. Um, but but it's a good experience because it does have to be accepted. It's not that there are very few of them, that just because you presented a paper and you submitted it to be in the proceedings shouldn't mean that they're just gonna take it, right? So there is somewhat of a selection process involved. And right? editing process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Proceedings are very highly valued in a lot of other fields. So right. even though it's still yeah. archaeology that you'd be publishing in, I don't think anybody's gonna go poo-poo to you because you've published well, it, it shows that you're active and yeah. you're actually doing stuff. Yeah. That's important. And I would add to that is there's something like 90-some PhD programs in archaeology in the States alone. You have hundreds of potential employers, lots of you know masters only programs, and when you go out there, it's there's a lot of different places you're probably going to, have to apply to, and whoever's on the committee, it's a bit of a, a crapshoot. So some people will think very highly of it. Some people will be like, "This is junk," but having it is going to be more of an advantage than not having it. Um, you're you know it's kind of a gamble. It depends what the higher committee sees in that how they rank stuff, but. Not having it means you break zero no matter what. Um, I'd say it's better to have it than not. And I guess I'm going off what Doug brought up about student run journals. Um, if you have a fairly large department with a very active student body or an archaeology and anthropology club, um, you 
could, you know, with a faculty advisor, create your own publication. Um, we did one at UW Milwaukee. Um, I was involved in one at Nebraska when I was a master's student that was already established. Um, you need to have a pretty good following, but it has been a really great process in peer review and trying to organize your editors and your students, and everyone's got term papers, and if you don't do something with them, they do sit in a shelf, and I guess was, this was pre-academia, um, .edu, the website, uh, so that's another outlet you could use. And I guess going back to an earlier question from, um, that I had while you were all talking, um, if you have uh, a lot of co-authored papers, per se, with uh, other faculty or your advisor, is that a negative? Thing as opposed to having a number of single author publications? No publication is a negative. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, that's, that's, that's. I mean, you look at medical papers and they have 15 authors in them, and that's the standard. So I don't think that's negative. I mean, as an editor, I like to know who was actually doing the writing. And because that's, I mean, that's not, and if it's not the corresponding author, then I mean, I think transparency and disclosure is, is critical. But I mean, we do, we do a lot of papers that the the secondary author is is the supervisor or the ex supervisor or the, the long term research colleague or whatever and and oftentimes in those cases that secondary person is useful to us as an editor when we're trying to mentor the primary author we do a lot of mentoring in, in our journal a lot of it and um, and I find it useful sometimes to sort of iterate certain points to the secondary you know make sure this is done you know. And I mean, I just I find that it's sometimes useful to kind of use that person as a co-mentor. If I know that's the relationship, then I can do that. But but I don't think there's any. Well, but but the, they don't, the point is is that in other fields uh, like biology or some other you know yeah. natural sciences, the co-edited or the co-authored ones are, are the are the standard. With us in archaeology, if there's two, maybe three, you know that's okay. But if you got something with six, those of us from longer ago saying, huh, oh, uh, I guess that's okay. But and, and, but as I'm least says, there is no such thing as a bad publication. Um, if you're going to be on a multi-author uh, uh, publication, the closer to the top, the yeah. better, of course. Yeah. Yes. But by all means, I, you know, I have, I had someone just email me the other day saying, remember we did this 20 years ago? I go, no. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm, I'm going to publish that and you can have something. Mind if I stick you on as a co-author? Oh, why the hell would I mind? You know, of course not. Why not? You know, it's. Who uh, cares if you got a forty page post and see if anybody? Yeah, well, but anyways, it's 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 a good thing to to start, and especially to see how the whole, the whole process works, and as you work your way up, the, I, I think we probably will see in archaeology more of these full time author things. Yeah. I've seen more lately. Especially, especially as you you get into very complex scientific issues as technology. Um, and our knowledge base is changing so rapidly in archaeology, and so so much of our work relies on these really spectacular um, transdisciplinary scientific teams, right? So you know you're gonna need, you're gonna you're gonna have to make those accommodations. So we are gonna see some changes in the trends of the way um, you know, um, especially journal-based stuff is is being put out. Um, you know, and, and you're gonna strive to have some single-authored stuff. I mean. You're, you're in the field, you all want that experience, but you know, any opportunity you have, I mean, I would argue that you can't have too many co be involved in too many co-authored things. It's just good. It's good experience. And, and this, may, this may apply to, to, the journal, to my journal more than others, I don't know, but we like, we especially want to see collaboratively written pieces. We seek them, we beg for them, we don't get enough of them. I would love to see more pieces where Maybe the primary author is the academic because he or she wants to, have, you know, everybody understands you want to have your CV and all that sort of thing. But maybe the secondary and to tertiary authors are people in the community with whom that person has worked. And if we can get their voices in there, if we can get even dialogic pieces that are co-authored, they will go to the top of our queue, frankly. Okay, we really want things like that. So, so if you do uh, community heritage work or community archaeology work, then by all means, at least for my journal, Consider uh, co-authoring with your with your with your collaborators. And co-authoring builds great relationships that outside of the publication will help you much further in your career later, or even currently. Um, the only thing I can see where you might run into an issue with lots of co-authored is if you're starting out um, in academia and all you have is co-authored papers. You might have to explain what you did for those papers. 
Um, if you go to a job interview at a university, but I mean, if you're going to CRM, they're just going to be very happy that you can publish and write. Um, yeah, so I don't think, as, as I said, there's no such thing as really a bad publication. Um, but you may just have to have that extra question or, or extra explanation if you go to an interview, um, just what you did on those co author papers. If you only have co author, probably diversity is a good thing, you know? Yeah. That, all that said, and I don't know how, you know, this is, we're taking a, a lot of this particular question, but I do remember that in graduate school there were a couple of graduate students who were working on the senior, the advisor's project, you know, his project, and that in those that did not get his permission to publish their work on his project were in a world of trouble, you know, and, and so, you know, if you're doing a graduate type project and your supervisor's involved in your work, you know, you're, so you're working on his or her site, her site, then um, you know either make sure, make sure they make sure they're involved in it or their co-authors or offer them offer them the opportunity to be if they want to be or at the very least get their permission. Let's put back to the ethics. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Make sure that everybody who's named on your paper knows that you're publishing your paper. Make sure the site you're working on that you have permission to publish on it. Uh, yeah, that comes up. I think it's almost yeah. unique to archaeology that uh, you know we have encountered places where uh, someone contacts us from the country, from the site, saying, why did you publish this paper you didn't have permission to? And that's where we get the most part of it. And, and, that, and that's on you as the scholar and the author. And, and I do see this, um, and I, you know, I don't think we see it so much um, in terrestrial, but we certainly see it an awful lot um, in underwater. Um, so every paper that comes into um, the Journal of Maritime Archaeology, we have to verify that you know the permits were in place, that the, the country that proved that you know that all of these different components is extremely extremely complex. But again, that's that ethics piece. That's that's really um, and reading your guidelines that probably outline all this. They stuff. do. They're that's very very clear, in fact, about even stating in the acknowledgments in our journal now that. Who provided the permission? What institution was it that authorized that that work could take place, that it could be published on, you know, all those types of things? Well, that's even, that, that in terms of community archaeology and heritage issue, one of the things we're interested in knowing, not only for legal reasons, but for um, epistemological reasons and that, we, we want to know for what purpose was did the work take place? And that's part of, you know, okay, maybe you did this, granted, you and your team did this, whatever, and you got, but for what, to what ends? was this work undertaken. And in the community or our heritage arena, sometimes that's very ambiguous and kind of sticky. All right, so um, we'll kind of move on. Um, a lot of our topics are being covered uh, in this first round of answers here. Um, seeing as more and more people are finding work outside of academia in, in CRM and in other industries, um, would this advice be applicable to all of them? Or should certain career paths seek more publications than others or certain forms of publication uh, over others? I think uh, publication gives you great advantage no matter what you're going into. So even if you're going into CRM and you publish in regional journals or local journals or something that a CRM archaeologist is going to use, that will help you incredibly. Um, especially if you're just starting out. I mean, a lot of people will have almost no experience or they'll have their field school experience. And if you can say, well, I've at least published something on New Mexico, post-colonial, whatever, you work in New Mexico, that might help you a lot. And publication is also a way of networking. So people read your work and find about, out about how, who you are, what you do, and sort of the quality of work you do. And if you're good at it, if you're good at your job, there's, that can't hurt you. Well, and, you know, one of the other things too, keep in mind that um, I, I, I agree. There's, there's no, you can't not publish enough, and it doesn't make any difference, um, you know, which field you're going into, whether it be public archaeology, working with museums, institutions, working with higher ed, working with CRM. You know, every single one of those disciplines needs you to be out there writing about what you're doing, right? And at the end of the day, keep in mind that, you know, we have an obligation as part of our profession. We're not doing this for ourselves. We're, we're in this because we love what we do, right? 
Uh, it's definitely a labor of love. You're not going to get wealthy at this. It's going to be frustrating. <laughs> There's lots of graduate school involved. So, you know, at the end of the day, right, but it, it's about being stewards of all of this cultural heritage back to the public. So you do have this obligation, quite frankly, I would argue, that part of the ethics of the discipline is you have to publish. No matter which of those fields that you're in, you have a responsibility to make sure that the information is put out there. And we're not supposed to just be working and writing for ourselves. Or even just for the CRM report. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we do a lot of that. It's the nature of what we yeah. do, right? But there are many, many opportunities, even in, in our CRM work, where there's, there's something that we've encountered, there's a project that we've done, it's easy to get the permissions, so we can put it out there in more of a public space. And, you know, so some of those other venues that are available for that, and quite frankly, are even better suited because you're going to actually get the information locally to where the folks are interested. You know, your local history magazine, um, your chamber of commerce, you know, or associated with the site publications. You know, those are real publishing. That's real publication work, and it's really, really important. One of my favorites that I see, um, you know, are the, the airline magazines. Right? Especially small regional carriers, they produce those things. Yeah. They want stories, right? Give it a try. Try publishing in that kind of a public venue. Um, it's really a great experience. And to Doug's point, you know, that's that's lots of meeting people and networking and you know all those different kinds of components. And to get even more basic, I would say having, you know, I'm in academia now, but when I was in Arkansas, I ran a, a contract firm. Good writing is Get it more basic than publishing. Good writing is going to be useful no matter what you do. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I had I had field texts that were just great field texts, and I could send them anywhere, but they weren't writing the reports because they they sucked. And, uh, and, and and it's when you're dealing with a firm that's hiring you, if you can write rather than having the person that's sending you out in the field have to rewrite your reports, uh, it, it just it does better for you. Now, I'd also kind of like to segue a little bit on this, is that different outlets demand different kinds of writing. Um, I'm sure these guys get all the time. Here's my field report. I'd like to publish this in your journal. A field report, even a good field report, is not a journal article, nor is it a regular academic book. But a story I had is the University of Alabama Press contacted me after I defended my dissertation and said, Dr. Well, Ewan, we'd like to publish your uh, dissertation. Uh, wow, okay. And I, you know, I showed up at the book room at the, at the SHA conference, and uh, the editor looks at me and goes, hi, Charlie, I go, hi. And she goes, is that your dissertation? And I said, yeah. And, and she said, that's not what we wanted. And I went, what? <laughs> and she said, no, we want a manuscript for a book based on your dissertation. And I went, thinking in my head, well, well, what's the difference? You know, can't you guys fix it to make it right? And that's not how it works. And unfortunately, at the next table, there was a bunch of other books, and one of them was turning your book into a dissertation. <laughs> and there's different tone. There's what's included. All the all the stuff that my committee made me take out of my dissertation because it was too uh, wordy and, and, and folksy. They wanted that put back in for the book so people would actually read it. Uh, so get, uh, find out from if you're working on a contract uh, project, you're going to have certain guidelines and those will have to be met. But you can take that and you can spin it into an article or a book chapter or something. But you do have to realize that, that it's different and then work on identifying those differences. I think kind of going along with what you're saying and what Anna was just saying, um, know who you're writing for, know who your audience is. If you're writing for the general public or an educated public, you have to write in that kind of style, and that should not be the same writing style as would a research report or your thesis, presumably. Um, you know, the, I look at journal articles, and my background isn't in archaeology, and I sort of understand what you guys are talking about at this point because I've been reading it for so long. But when I first started, I saw a lot of jargon. And that's not saying that in a research article there shouldn't be jargon because you guys are talking to each other and you understand what the language is and you understand what you're saying to each other. But if you're writing in an airline magazine, if you're writing for maybe a regional archaeology uh, magazine, that's writing to the general public and that's a different style of writing. And I think that um, 
there was a recent SHA blog about branding yourself. And I thought that was a very interesting article about, you know, he starts off saying he Googled his name and how did his name come up? And it probably represents all the different writing that you do. The writing for the public, writing for your research, probably your thesis will appear online as well. All of that writing, all of that representation of yourself are different audiences, but it's what you do, it's writing for different audiences, it's still all valid and important, especially for CRM that you're writing for the public because very often you're getting funding from the public, I think, for CRM. You're getting it from the Department of Defense, you're getting it from the Department of Transportation, and it's coming to the point where if you're getting federal funding, you're going to have to publish for the public and you have to make it available for the public. And, you know, I'm not, there might be different guidelines about how you go about doing that, but it is supposed to happen. So, um, yeah, just be aware of who your audience is and who you're writing for. And that would be just my to, thought on that. And even within the world of, quote, professional journals that are peer reviewed, the audiences are different. And most of them will have their own guidelines, and if you have questions, ask the editors. In our case, we do not want jargon in our journal. But, you know, and we're, we are a professional peer review journal, and it goes through a very rigorous process. Many papers have as many as 10, 10 11 drafts before they're done. And we work very hands on with almost every author, junior and senior, at times, that need just as many drafts. Sometimes, because because they send it to us thinking that you know that, they, that we want a certain thing, and what in fact JCAH is a little different. And so I mean I don't want to bang on about that too much, but 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 except for the fact that know, know your audience extends to knowing the journal that you're sending it yep. to. Look at look at their guidelines. Take them seriously. Uh, and, and a couple of things is. The good news is you can take essentially the same article yeah. and spin it into a couple of yeah. publications because yeah. it's going to a popular audience, it's going yeah. to an academic yeah. audience. It's, you know, so it's that's good for you, and it's not yeah. that much more work to, to just kind of reformat the article. Second, and this is, I, I, I think what you all would say is certainly a, 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 in the authoring side when I turn to things, if the editors come back and say, we really think this should be this way, just do it, you know. Don't say, it. No, these are my words, and they're going to stay. Yeah, don't be difficult. Just unless it, to me, when I publish, unless the changes they want are substantive, and I, I, I it turns my uh, article into a, a bunch of lies. I won't do that. But if, if they say, "Gee, we think this sound better this way," yeah, okay, that's good. Cool. So be, don't be difficult. <laughs> And to kind of segue back actually to the first question is um, what universities could do to help people become better publishers is most people, you know, you do your undergraduate first couple of classes in writing and then after that it's all term papers and stuff in archaeology and most people come out of the university thinking they can write. And it's very humbling to realize that you can't actually write. You should see the stuff I get back from the editors. Yeah, and really go out there and learn. So if you get the opportunity in postgraduate or later in undergraduate to take classes and how to write, and not just write, and, and there's so many different styles. So writing for a newspaper is very different. A newspaper, your entire article needs to be summed up in the very first sentence. All of it. All the findings. Everything major. That's a newspaper. And then you go into details and it goes down. Or it's an academic paper, you eventually sum it up at the end. And so that's very two different, very different types of writing. And go out, read books. There's lots of books that have been written on how to write. And I mean, it's going to be a very humbling experience. Get a thick skin. Yeah. You realize that it's, it's practice. It's a lot of practice. And, and look at your editors as collaborators. <coughs> and I, you know, we try very hard to be respectful of people who send things to us, even when they're terrible. And sometimes that's a bit of a trick. But, you know, at the same time, I, you know, the, the best papers that have appeared in our new journal, it's only, what, two years, two years old now, um, but the very best papers are the ones that we have really had a collaborative relationship with the author. And that the first draft that they send is by no means what they what winds up in press, and it's a better article as a result of our collaboration, which we hope is mutually respectful. But, you know, it's like you know, Charlie says, you know, they can't have their Nippers in a twist because we want to, you know, delete a whole paragraph that's not relevant to our readers. 
Well, the other thing, and I want to piggyback on something that Doug said because I, I agree. You know, oftentimes, and especially as we see graduate programs, whether they be for um, for CRM work or, or for, for whatever, um, we're in an era right now where graduate programs are being revamped, rapidly being revamped. And a lot of what's being moved out of graduate programs are those opportunities to learn, to be a writer, to learn, to be a scholar, to learn, to really understand the ethics of both of our, our profession and what it means to publish in our profession. Because we need to get that new course and hear about this emerging technology that's going to really change the way we do our thing, right? So what's going to get cut out? So one of the things that I highly recommend is that, you know, I'll take those opportunities and if they're no longer in your program, think really, really hard about going and taking that course anyway, right? Take, everybody should have a historiography class. Everyone should have a historiography class because it will give you the background that you need to understand that process. And those have disappeared from graduate programs. But they're still being taught at your university, guaranteed, because that professor that taught that course has been taught teaching it for 72 years. And he just won't retire. <laughs> so it's there. Trust me. Go find it. Uh, I just finished with writing is a skill. And supposedly it's 10,000 hours to become skilled at anything. And you're not going to get 10,000 hours of writing just from publishing in, in journal articles. Publish as much, or write as much as you can. I know it's cliche, write an hour a day or a thousand words or something like that. You really need to do that for years and years and years. Um, I, I mean, I could only recommend start a blog or something that just gets you out there writing every day and practice writing. So set a goal of like trying to write for a newspaper, trying to write for a magazine, trying to write, you know, for scientific journals. Um, You've got to practice nonstop, and I mean I've been practicing for years now. And I still suck at it, um, but it's just something you have to constantly work at. It's not something that you can. There are a couple of naturally talented people who will go out there and just write up an article, and it's perfect the first time. I think that's maybe one percent, and that is being incredibly generous. And they will frustrate you because you'll see them, but most everyone else, it takes a lot of practice. Right, so outside of the obvious topics of dissertation research, thesis work, the latest survey project we have conducted over the summer or this past season, where else can students look for these topics to publish on? How do you get into something? Not that we need anything else on our table, but outside of your current research. Can you, uh, can you explain how, how would you find it, like if, if I'm not going to write about dissertation or my research project this year, how else can I find a topic to oh. write on? Where do you find those? Oh, so, yeah. so, I, I think whatever is your inspiration, right? I tell folks all the time, what's your passion? Teach it. What's your passion? Write it. Um, you know, part of it is, you know, go volunteer on something, or if you're working with a colleague and it's their, you know, it's their project, but go tell the story of what that thing was. Again, it's, it gives that that opportunity to to write something, write something a little bit differently. And then, you know, there there are opportunities for you to practice that skill all around you. Quite frankly, there just really are. And it doesn't need to be original research. Um, magazines, we in archaeology know all this stuff. The general public, you can write the same story multiple times in multiple ways. I suspect and be, a lot of PIs would love it if someone would say, hey, can we co-author something and let me write the public pieces and, and can you can we work to get collaborate on it? And then you know, there can be ways yeah. to do that. And people are still learning stuff. I mean, Stonehenge, people still don't know what that is. They're still discovering it for the first time, and you can be the person who helps them discover that. And you know, it's been written about a billion times, but there's still people out there who need to learn or want to learn. So it doesn't have to be original research if you're just looking to practice and get stuff out there. You know, a bit of advice uh, I got from Brian Fagan. I was he was visiting our university, and I got assigned to take him around, and it was really tight. He's the most prolific author I have ever met, and. Some of some of my more serious colleagues go, yeah, he writes a bunch of stuff in textbooks. Yeah, well, <laughs> he makes a zillion dollars doing it. That's where the money is, textbooks. <laughs> Anyways, um, I asked him. I said, I said, how how are you so prolific? How do you do it? I mean, every year there's another book or you know something coming out. And he goes, I, you know, this what you were talking about. I, I sit down and I write a thousand words every day, every day on something. And he said, and I said, and 
But then I said, but God, what do you write on? And I mean, what, and he says, never turn down an, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to publish. If someone asks you to publish on something, and they know you're an archaeologist, and you go, well, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you can find out enough to be able to publish on, on just about anything in art, especially for the popular uh, the public. Uh, you can, it, it yeah, may not carry the same bulk as a peer review research article, but you're still writing and you're still getting stuff out there. Uh, even if you're just blogging on issues of reality TV and archaeology or metal detecting or something like that, do it. And, and so you're still in the mix. And, and then you have an opportunity to do a, uh, a research uh, article for a journal, you know, then, then you're there to do that. And you've got the writing experience. But if you need a place to write Wikipedia, the archaeology articles are so-so. There's plenty of room to improve. And it's a very good style. It is try to write clearly. And it's actually much more rigorous than a lot of people get. Yeah, and you have to cite all your sources. And someone else may eventually come along and make corrections. So it's a bit of pure feedback. So if you need something, go through Wikipedia and start improving our And the SHA blog. Get on there. Or our blog. Journal blogs. Like our journal has a blog. And we have, we have for certain kinds of papers we publish that are not designed to be a full-blown research paper that is designed to be a reflections type of thing or whatever. So every, again, every audience, every journal, every, is going to be different. You can't, you have to really look at it and have looked at that issue and looked at the guidelines and talked to the editor. Uh, so this would segue nicely into uh, discussion of technology. So we've mentioned Wikipedia and Wikis, and as an instructor, sometimes I hesitate to assign those or cite those in the writing post for my course. Um, is there still a signal attached to that type of because I won't it let can people cite it because anyone can uh, log in and, ch and change a page, for example, or, or are wikis now becoming part of our standard within the industry. When I'm writing, if I'm jumping into a new topic and I don't and I don't know anything about it, I've, often I start there because the best wiki pages are the ones, the Wikipedia pages, at any rate, are the ones that have the actual citation, which I didn't go look at. Yeah. And that's the, what I cite is the actual citation that I, not that you, I will, I will, I, we won't let a Wikipedia itself be cited. But, but it's a good starting place to, to, dip, to dip into a field and see what's out there. And I think, yeah, I think it is good, good practice for writing too. So I'm going to be slightly different on this and say, so first of all, there, there is an incredible stigma attached and don't cite Wikipedia. But if you've actually ever gone through the, the process of, go and try to um, defame or destroy or a Wikipedia article, and you'll see how quickly it's corrected. It is, yeah. And I'm of the view you should be allowed to cite Wikipedia because it's someone's work. And sometimes Wikipedia says something better. And it's hard because you can't give an author credit. Well, actually, you can. You can go through and look and say, yeah, you figure out who the author is. And maybe if I can go multiple authors, you can say Tom 43 and Joseph 12. Uh, wrote this, uh, and sometimes it's better written than most academic books. I wish we could cite it, but I will say right now, don't cite it. It still hasn't got to that point. Um, but there are. Is it, but don't cite it. Yeah, it is. It is a. Oh, I think it's a legitimate piece of work because it is people creating this, and who are. Who I've have, gone into Wikipedia and changed things that were wrong about the site I was working on. I mean, and I've gone in to change things that I had a different opinion about. You know, and. I, you can go back into the history and you can see all those changes for yeah, sure. And because it's not also a primary source, it's not it's not supposed to be any sort of data. So I, I'd say cite it as a nice definition. Wikipedia tends to be really great for definitions, but yeah. you should never cite it as a primary source because it's not actually a primary source and it says that in Wikipedia. So, um, but yeah, I, I would say there's still incredible stigma attached, and unfortunately, don't use it for anything. <laughs> as your jump, use it as your entry point to get yeah. the literature. <clears throat> you know, especially if you are out, if you are working outside academia when you don't have access to JSTOR and stuff. So it's often good sources. So we should use it, not cite it, should we write for it? Yes. Will that be a CD line? And for the experience. I mean, the, you'll see Wikipedia, you'll know, you've all seen it, but this article is just not, not really vetted yet, you know? and. Some of them are better than others. I saw someone with a question. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like your, your approach to Wikipedia um, is very similar to what I was taught when I was in high school about using, like, Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. Um, like, I was, I was always taught, read the Encyclopedia article, never cite it, <laughs> because it's just an overview. 
Yeah, I mean, it's tertiary material, and that's why the real value of an encyclopedia entry are the citations, or the end, the references at the end. That's where you should go to and read those articles, read those books. Um, it should be an introduction to a subject. It shouldn't be the end-all, be-all for a subject, because it's condensed. I mean, they have to write 5,000 words on, you know, behavioral archaeology. Well, you can't sum up behavioral archaeology in 5,000 words. You need to go somewhere else. That honestly gives you really good training. So when we're talking about go look at the citations, you should do that in a journal article. You'd be surprised how many times you go to a citation and you read it and you're like, no, it didn't actually say what this person is citing. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I've actually seen it happen where multiple people, multiple authors will cite one author who cited another. And they only cite the cite the cite cider, and they got it wrong, and so you get these sort of myths that eventually go through journal articles and been peer reviewed and stuff. Um, so follow the what you do in Wikipedia with everything. When someone cites something, go and read that if you can, and make sure that how they're interpreting it is how you would interpret it. And if, if at all possible. Go back to the source, cite the source, right? So you you can include, you know, in your references and um, the the other places where you found it, right, or that it appears. But the thing you cite, the thing that you're you're actually making comment on, when at all possible, needs to be that original. So, yeah, primary or the secondary literature, yeah. or tertiary literature, which is encyclopedia. Well, or, but to the point of the journal articles, you know, e e even even as you're going through there, you know, if, if, if that is in fact what you're finding, go back to the original to be your source of sight. Have a conversation and talk about the different interpretations. That's fine, but you, you do need to understand that that happens all the time. Well, and that, that's an excellent time. point. I'll get papers in from grad students, and they'll say it. So and so said this, and I'll go, wait a second, I read that article. They didn't say that. You're not going, and I'll, and I'll confront them, and I'll say. Did you read the original article? Well, I, I it was cited. I, I said, no, 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 no. Go back to that original article. And, and editors know the same thing as well. <clears throat> yes, it is more work. <laughs> I mean, if you're running, I, I was talking to a, a guy who edits a legal journal. And in the legal journals, they actually thought the editors go back to every single citation and make certain that it's actually correct. Which I would just. Oh, my hair. Oh, God. <laughs> just do it the right way. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, you all have a lot of experience in journals. Uh, what would your opinions be in other forms of publication? So single author book, um, books themselves, articles, multi-author, um, edited volumes, and then maybe some great uh, areas of great literature, manuscripts on electronic resources like academia or uh, things that used to sit on shelves in private research libraries that are now out on the internet. Are, are some more important? Should we pursue some more than others? I, I'm going to jump in just from my own personal perspective, and then, I, in retrospect, I wish that I had now published some more of my pieces in journal articles as opposed to the edited volumes that they're in. And I, I wasn't seeking an academic, full-time academic tenure job, and I never have, and so that wasn't my criteria. But, and I and I really like the fact that I was in these edited volumes because they're good, they're good volumes. But the ones, that, the articles that I have written that have gotten the most citations and the most exposure in terms of people using them in their work are the journal articles because they're more accessible. And again, back to accessibility, I was happy to be included until you invited me, I have to play. You know, and that, that's great and I got experience and that sort of thing, but I, in retrospect I wish I had done a, a little bit more of a shift of more journal articles as opposed to as many edited volumes. Does that point be changing with well, publishing is changing no matter what, and so you're seeing a lot of more breakdown of barriers with open access and the internet. And so it's now becoming more of a definitely change in quality, but a lot of books are now peer reviewed, um, and it depends on your publisher. And so a book is now just, you know, 100,000 words or 60,000 whatever piece as opposed to 6,000. And everyone's getting it off the internet no matter what. Um, and they'll be peer reviewed. So it's well, I know it goes on my CV. If it's a peer reviewed book, I put it under my peer reviewed publications. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people, I mean, I guess if I was applying for a job someplace, they would maybe question it. And I could say, no, that was peer reviewed. But some are. You're right. but, but there's also, you, 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 if you're doing more traditional work, you have to be careful. Like, if, even if you do a book, it may be priced the way books are now with academic books. You're looking at $100 easily. Oh. And that's, that's at the cheap end. Yeah. Um, and $100. 
means university libraries can afford it, but doesn't mean most of your peers can. And, and that's sort of also the thing with like edited volumes, they tend to be a book basically more into that. So sometimes you can end up with, it looks good on your CD, but no one's able to read it because it's locked down in you know, an edited volume that not a lot of people have access to. One of the other things to keep in mind too is as the trends of publishing are changing as it relates to access, I mean, you know, there's a lot of value in doing an independent book. There's a lot of value in doing an edited, being part of an edited volume and all these other different formats. But keep in mind that it used to be that if I, you wrote a book or you wrote, wrote a chapter in an edited volume and it was printed and it was a $100 book and it sat in the library or even, you know, on the rare shelf in your professor's office. That's not the case anymore, right? Because even in single author books, you know, my, my own books, for example, you know, they because the technology has changed so much that now the publishers are able to, able and willing, quite frankly, let you jump in on this one because we have this debate all the time, able and willing, right, to pull individual chapters that were never, ever intended to be a standalone piece, right? And now suddenly they're a standalone piece because the technology is allowing the publishers to release just that piece if somebody wants it or wants to be compiled into something else. So you also have to understand that, you know, in those formats now, everything that you write could be recombined someplace in some other manner. And that is happening over and over again. So, for example, um, you know, with all of the SHA co-publications, we now have to have an abstract for every single chapter, even in a single author book. And that's the reason why. References are now at the end of chapters, not going to be, you know, in a reference as cited or a bibliography in the end of the book. Again, that's the reason why. So that's a game changer in terms of some of these things. And you just need to be mindful that, you know, that thing that I wrote over here that's really connected to that chapter before and to that chapter behind yeah. may suddenly appear independently. Well, yeah. I, what's the rule about academia? Somebody tell me, because I don't believe it. I know that I've signed, you know, you get this released release from the publisher and, you know, my typical we'll just sign it and send it back. So I, I think we should probably, authors should look at those more carefully because as times yeah. are changing. Oh, so what is the rule about um, academia.edu? Does it just vary by whichever you signed with the publisher as to whether you could publish it and every, how long after publication you could publish it? Every publisher has a different um, rule about that. So pay attention to those yeah, rules. Yeah, and releases. you should ask your publisher what is that for journal articles and for, for book chapters, what is their... Uh, uh, the word. What is there, uh, what are you allowed to do with your article? What are you allowed to do with your book chapter? Uh, there are rules for putting things on your own website. There are rules for putting things on a repository website. If you pay for open access, where can you put it, you know, immediately? Um, but in terms of what Annalise was saying with the availability of books online now, the way that uh, electronic journals kind of revolution revolutionized the way that you do research 15, 20 years ago, being available online, that's what's happening to books now, is that every book that we publish is now available online, and every chapter that is in that book needs to, in a way, be looked at as if it were a journal article that has an abstract, that it has keywords, that it has references, because that's how people are going to find your book chapter as they do your journal article. And all of those things are needed so that it is a standalone piece, that people can find that standalone piece, even though it's part of a larger work. Um, and I'm telling people all the time with the books that they're writing, the books that they are part of, um, you know, I, it can be part of someone's syllabi, as are journal articles all the time, as have book chapters have been before. It's just that they're easily, more easily accessible and they can just go to, you know, their university access to that book. Um, in, ter yeah, in terms of the, the copyright, it's, um, like I said, you should find out what, if you're publishing with a particular journal, a particular publisher, a particular book uh, publisher, find out what their clearance is, their copyright clearance is, because it is different for everybody. Uh, for us, if it's if you're putting your what we call author main uh, author formatted, which means you know the word document basically, you can put that on your own website as soon as the book is published. That's fine. That's not a repository though. So that's not academia.edu, it's not ResearchGate, it's not any other kind of repository. That does have to wait. So, you know, question your question your publishers. Read that consent form for sure, because a lot of it is outlined there. 
Uh, but if it's not outlined and you don't understand, this is your work. You have every right to go to the publisher and say, what can I do with this? But, you know, back to that single authored book question piece, though, because of this very thing, it is changing the way you now write a single author book, right? Without question. So, it has really, the, the technology impact, we are now starting to see that it is changing the, the manner in which a single author volume has to be written and structured so that every individual chapter has a context it needs to stand alone. Are you seeing that with all the publishers that you're working with though, or is that just because no, <laughs> yeah, you know, no, you're seeing you're okay. seeing it with them. It is moving in that direction. Okay. So the the bigger the press, even the bigger academic presses, um, more so than the smaller ones. The smaller ones are still don't have that right. the technology and the database systems behind uh, to do that. But more and more of them are moving that direction. Okay. So and a lot of that has to also do is once you get to digital books, a lot of chapters tend to be their own PDF. Exactly. And yes. then all of a sudden they get put somewhere. Well, so even author puts on their website, you suddenly get this loss of context. Right. And it gets placed all over, it's shared on the internet, email, stuff like that. So it's it's it is basically how any book now that's gone digital is almost a separate chapter. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh yeah, we know that you got to share PDFs, that's no big secret with us. It will end up everywhere. Uh, and so it's it's good that it's a self contained document that it has the references at the end. That's why yeah, even for an authored book, it's better that it is a contained document because it could go anywhere. And if you're asking what... Yeah, it is pain wrong. If you're asking what really... It, it, say you're out there and you're thinking, well, what should I? Should I do this article? Should I do this book chapter? What counts more? Well, it depends on what arena. And, you know, if you're applying yeah. to, to go in the, into academia, I would say anything refereed is going to be better than anything not refereed. Uh, I had a colleague that said... You know, referee journal articles are better than books. And he said that until he actually published a book. And then he said, <laughs> change a little bit about that. Um, what about having a chapter in a referee book as opposed to a referee article? The thing with an article is that you have some control over it and you can get it into the process and through the hopper. Book chapters are a bit easier to do, but I've got, I can't even remember now, I've got several chapters out there that have been in waiting for the edited volume to get through the process and some of them I'm sure will never, I, like I said, I've forgotten about them. And someone says, damn it, I wish they'd get that book going. I go, well, yeah, yeah, that was a while ago. So and I'm at the point where I can not worry as much about it, but if you're going to do uh, a book chapter, that's still good, especially if it's in a edited books out of, say, university presses, those are all peer reviewed. Uh, so they count. Um, do they count as much as a, 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 a refereed article? Eh, probably not, um, but they're still they're still good. And if you've got a good editor for your volume that can jam that thing through and it's staying on you guys, that's great. Um, and if, it's, if it really does take forever, you know, maybe early on you need to decide how, uh, how long you're going to wait. Yeah, pull before it. You, you pull it. And, okay, now how, we're starting to move into electronic <clears throat> journals and things like that. I have to say, from someone kind of senior in the whole deal, where the faculty are still coming to grips with this whole, how much do you online journals and things like that, how much do those count? And, and we're trying to be modern about it, saying, well, yeah, we see that it's all going there. But right now, I think, you know, it's kind of transitional as to what. I did a, uh, a book online, uh, it, was a, it was a conference, and everybody did chapters, and when I told them, yeah, this is going to be online, and it's, you know, we're not going to distribute it openly, I had five people drop out. Uh, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it for, some, for something that actually sees print. I suspect in the next, within the next few years, that's not going to be the case. But right now, it's still a little transitional, which is still kind of it's kind of exciting. You can you can get more into that. I also say a lot of your faculty, you know, if you're applying to grad school, and, and now that they've changed the GRE scores, we're all still kind of this is where we're all struggling like. I don't know what those scores are anymore, uh, and, and having to relate it to when we were. Same thing, and, and the reason I bring this up is so your publications, this is a really important open source publication. Some of your archaeology professors will go, huh, what the hell is that? And you're going to be prepared to explain what that is. And, and, yeah. and some practical advice, so if you are, if you have been approached for an uh, edited book, 
some questions you should ask is what's the deadline and how strict they're going to be. So I did an edit volume last year and we gave people a deadline and we let it slip by a week for some people who just want to do a little polishing. And we had something like 20 people say they were interested and ended up publishing 14. And we cut those people. But a lot of people won't do that. And what happens with edit books is they're waiting on that one chapter. Yeah. And so you ask the question, are you going to cut people from this book? Is it possible to cut people from this book? Because sometimes with publishers, they've said, you know, we're going to do 10 chapters and they only got 10 authors and they have to wait for that 10th person to come along. So that can tell you like timelines. So ask questions about, you know, <clears throat> will people be cut? Is there a final deadline or can this try to figure out, is this going to be one of those books that 20 years from now, oh, I completely forgot about that. Nice to get a print, you know, something to print now, but um, figure that out. Figure well, out and, if and meet the deadlines. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, and meet the deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Strive for that, yeah. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I know that when I get a proposal, that more than likely, the, unfortunately, the deadline won't be what ends up being when it's submitted to me, and that the like the, the structure of the book isn't necessarily going to be what it ends up being. And that's just kind of the nature of the business. But everyone should strive to, if you make a commitment, you should adhere to the commitment. But you also have to think, if this isn't getting published, what is the best thing for me to do? But you know, try to try to honor your commitments. I guess is the takeaway from that. All right. So, um, given all of that, what do you see as are some of the biggest hurdles of student space in the process? Is there a lot of competition for space in volumes or journals, uh, and how can they overcome those? Yeah, the, the issue of space in journals just truly, truly depends. You know, some some journals, you know, it's, it's a three-year backlog. We were talking about that the other day. If, if you know, you're looking at a journal and you make inquiry to the editor, and they say, you know, you know, once you're all the way through the process and it's it's ready to go to print, but we have a three-year backlog. Walk away. Yeah, you, there's not enough time in your career at that point for you to be waiting for that. I mean, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. And, you know, so, so some of them have, have space, they're readily looking for things all the time, especially, um, you know, journals that now have the ability to have, um, you know, online. So as soon as, you know, for example, for, for uh, Journal Maritime Archaeology um, and many others, you know, as soon as we finish with them and they actually make it through copy edit, they're, they are published online in their final print form. They're not in the volume yet, but all the citation, everything associated, with it, it's up, it's, it's live, it's good to go. You can cite it just like you will when it actually shows up three months later in the print version. Um, and so that's a really, really big deal. And it's because of that, I would argue, it allows us to speed up some of the process from the backlog. But back to your question, what's the biggest challenge? Um, I think that the biggest challenge is um, find a mentor. Seriously, find find a mentor. In the same way that you find a mentor to help you go and learn how to be a great archaeologist in the field, find a mentor to help you learn how to be a great writer and a great producer in our field of the information. Um, I, you know, like Carol, we had this conversation. I spent a lot of time, and some of my fellow editors even give me a hard time about it. Um, Working with authors, and and especially um, in the journal or even in, in the, those book settings, just you know, and as long as you're willing to work to make the changes, I'm willing to stick it out with you. And and I've got um, you know, uh, young scholars that you know, and manuscripts that have come in, you know, and a year later, because they're still actively working on them, they've not missed a deadline. They're making every single deadline I give them, and making those revisions, and bringing those things back in. I'll give you a lot of time because you're consistently working and trying to strive to make that thing better. And the fact of the matter is, you know, there's a fair number of editors that are out there that we will actually do that. It's not this whole notion that we reject you and then you walk away. Um, and even, if the, even if the editor in chief or whatever doesn't have time to do that, I mean, our editorial board is asked to Part of their deal on signing on to our editorial board is that are you willing to help mentor authors who need support with language? Because we do it, we seek international contributions, so often language is an issue. Are you willing to closely, line by line, if needed, edit something and work with, uh, collaborate with authors and mentor them? And they all sign on that they're willing to do that. 
So we will find someone who can do that. If you know, if you're if, if the, the auditor chief can or the co-editor, whatever, then then he or she could usually find someone. Uh, if you say that you need that, they you know they yeah. want your article. You know, it might be useful uh, for some folks may may know the whole process that your article goes through, but it, it might be useful now to sort of say you turn in, you you identify a journal that that you want to publish in, you read their guidelines, you prepare your manuscript according to that, you send it in. Then that, uh, I'll just talk for SHJ for historical archaeology, goes to the editor who assigns it to an associate editor who has some knowledge over that, that area. That person, that associate editor, then finds three reviewers that are knowledgeable on the topic that you've submitted, sends off the manuscript to them. They have, I believe, 45 days uh, to look at it and make their comments. They send them back in. So, Right off the bat, you're looking at a couple of months uh, before it even comes back. Then, uh, then the uh, it can either come back as, nah, we don't think this is appropriate, uh, or well, this is perfect, publish it as is. That never happens either. Uh, <laughs> usually, uh, they'll have accept with revisions or revise and resubmit. And if it says revise and resubmit, do that. And, uh, but jump on it. If it's revise and resubmit, then when you resubmit it after making uh, addressing the comments of the reviewers, it gets sent back out to those reviewers, and so that's you know they've got that time again. It comes back. Um, then it gets in if it's been revised, resubmitted, and accepted. Then it gets into the queue uh, with the other ones that have been accepted, and uh, it, 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 depending on how long that queue is. Uh, it, it, Maybe the next issue, probably not. Maybe you know next year that it comes out. Every, and every journal is going to have a different process. And ours is different. You know, we 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 have you, you, uh, we like to get an introductory email or letter telling us what you want to talk about. We'll respond with, well, this is on point. This is this fits our guidelines. You know, we'd like to see a full draft. Here are our guidelines. Here is the style sheet. Please follow it. Mm -hmm. uh, you yes, know, I, I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, we don't care if it's we don't care about it if a initial article is in the style sheet or not. But later on, if you actually submit it, it's amazing the number of times, even for senior people, that we have to go through and copy edit to the right font. I mean, please. <laughs> so, you're just pet peeve. Uh, but, but we don't, you know, and our process is different. Yeah. <laughs> well, but we're a new journal, and we are still, we're a new journal, and we're not, happily for everyone who might want to publish, we're, we don't, we really do try to, you know, if it's got some merit, we'll work with it, yeah. you know? And um, and so we every journal is going to have its own process. So Charlie gave the process for historical archaeology. It's different for JCAH. It's, I suspect it's different yeah. for every. How many how many reviews you get? How many whether the associate editors or or editorial board is involved in those reviews? All that's going to vary from journal to journal. Feel free to ask the editor what they can expect. You know what is your process? Oftentimes I'm not even asked what my pro what our process is. You know. We look at the abstract, we ask them to go ahead with it, we offer to work with them on developing the content. You know, we give them a lot of times initial response because we are kind of doing something different and I don't want to send it to a peer reviewer without it, you know, with, if it's really a mess, frankly. So a lot of times we'll do editing on the front end to make sure it's, 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 what, it's, it's able to be peer reviewed. And then we send it for peer review. We get two, maybe it's HA gets three. Um, sometimes we send it for a, a subsequent review to another set of reviewers if if it comes back and we're still not certain of it, you know. And I don't know how everybody is different about this too, but we oftentimes will say, try to respond to the changes in track changes. That's going to be different from editorial. Edit, 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 but I, if I get a, a, a paperback and the author has kept, it, say the review, say the revisions were moderate, not moderate in number, you know. I want it in track changes. I want to see where they make the changes. Now that's just me. Uh, but if I have, if I get it blank and, and they've all got it nice and pretty again, I can't tell whether they've done anything unless I, once again, go back in there and read it as if it was brand new, which is a pain. So, so you know, every ask people what they want because I suspect the process would be different for every single editor. Yeah, it is. Yes. I mean, the general process is the same, setting it out for you, getting the comments, but the timeline, how many reviewers you've got, you know, how willing they are to interact with you, well, that's going to vary from journal to journal. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is, you know, send, make sure it's clean when it comes in. Yes. 
It's yeah, like when you're writing your journal articles, if it's sloppy, the margins are crappy, you know, you've already pissed off the person reading it. And they don't, you want somebody in a happy mood when they're reading your stuff. And you know, really, the putting it in the style guide, it takes you 10 seconds, you know, to put it in the right font with the right size margins, and that's not. I've, I've sent many articles back, I mean, just for a set of context in my faith, but uh, especially um, when you're talking about all the time that's spent in the editing process. Um, um, I have sent many an article back to an author and said, you need to go hire a local copy editor. You know, I'm sorry, but your skill set, the content is great, and we can keep working on this, especially my authors that English is not their first language. We are also a global journal. And one of the recommendations that I make is you need to go hire an English language copy editor before you send this back to the journal again, because I cannot even send it out before you Don't send something in that is that far gone. For those of you that are you know, still um, you know, at the university, uh, one of the hidden gems of many universities is a writing center. I cannot tell you how many grad students look at me like I'm crazy when I say, did you, did you go find out, does your university have a writing center? Because for free, they'll sit down with you and go through your submission. Line by line, if you take the guidelines in there and spend the time, somebody will sit down and go through that with you. One, one time, do it. Go find out if you have one at your university. I, uh, I see Dr. Ford back there shaking his head. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, he <laughs> says. <laughs> Find a senior colleague or someone that you know is a good writer or even a professor who might, who might be willing, willing, willing to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say make a formal peer review. Have a friend, friend anyone before look at, it comes in. Yes, yes anyone yes. look at it, they'll catch some of those glaring typos or yeah. anything, and they can tell you if it makes sense. And maybe you may want to send that to a friend who doesn't do archaeology and see if they can actually understand your paper. So if they can, that's very good. Yes. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and they might have questions about jargon, but yeah, like just send it to someone else. Always have a friend look at it before you send it off. Absolutely, absolutely. And I guess if you're pursuing a non-professional publication for lay people, that would be especially helpful. Yeah, just same. Yeah, same, 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 same rules. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they may, you still will probably get peer review back and all sorts of corrections and stuff, but. Your friends are at least there to make sure that it makes sense. That's that's the very that's like you want the very bare minimum, which is that it makes sense. I mean that's for every publication. I, I think I've done that with all of my graduate term papers. And my only comment is not your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Unless your spouse is a really good editor. Mine is my best oh, editor. No, no, He's mine, a writer. Mine is stuff. great, but she's like, she's, she's cut me off. She's like, no more. <laughs> <laughs> not reading your stuff <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment about the writing center. I work at my university writing center in East Carolina, and I actually prefer and enjoy it more when graduate students bring in their papers to read and have them read undergraduate papers. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent! Awesome! <laughs> Our university actually has a graduate writing center, too, so there may be those resources in somewhere. You know, you don't have to worry about people who are used to reading undergrad papers and just to knowing the quality of work that's expected out of graduate students. And so our graduate professional organization has set this up and organized it. And you can also be part of that writing center then and get the experience of working and reviewing other students' papers through that. Many, many universities have them. If you don't know, go ask. It is a great resource for you. Any other questions we can answer right away before we move on? So, um, as more students uh, become bound for careers outside of academic and we touched on this a little bit already, um, what are some benefits you could think of uh, in pursuing non traditional, non journal, maybe even non print mediums of publication? I think the biggest is experience. I think this point is, is very well made. Any opportunity you have to practice writing and to practice telling others about what it is that we do, why does it matter, what does it tell us, what we learn from it, in all those different venues, then that's a great opportunity for you. I'd also say, um, even for uh, faculty, when I, when I started publishing, your, your public stuff wasn't valued. I had an article in Archaeology Magazine 
and accounted for nothing for, for my tenure. However, though, things are starting to turn around. Uh, the president, when Vince Stepanatis was president of the SAA, he sent around a letter to every uh, department of anthropology saying, please count some of the more publicly oriented publications uh, in tenure promotion considerations. We are being urged to, uh, to write more for regular people. Also, and I just think it's a good idea. I mean, that's what we're, we're supposed to do. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to either or do both. As I said, you can spin an article from the public from a, a research thing. But I will say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got some stuff in press at the University of Press of Florida, and they're saying now they want the uh, academic books geared so that the interested lay public can access it. Uh, so I think less jargon nowadays, more popular stuff uh, is, is becoming more, uh, more the norm. I would add, don't be afraid to go for sort of non-traditional places as well. It won't, so most journals, if you were to say do a blog article and then try to publish a paper, a blog is not a paper. It's not, they're not going to be like, oh, this has been published somewhere else. Most journals just don't, unless you've gone and done exactly verbatim, you know, different audiences, publishing a public, you know, like an archaeology magazine, and then doing a journal article about it, they're not going to be like, oh, well, this is an archaeology magazine, we're not going to publish it, because it's two different things. You'll have data. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. In fact, I even asked the University Press, I said, well, this article, you know, the archaeology magazine wanted me to do this article on DeSoto, and I had this book in, in press with them, and I, and I said, is there a conflict here? And they said, no, no, in fact, it's good advertising for the book. Yeah, that's the same thing, yeah. Being that a lot of these sort of non-traditional places like blogs still be professional. So like a blog can only help you if you are professional, you write well, and you get your name out there. More people will probably read your blog than your journal articles. Um, it's just how the internet works. <coughs> Some journals have, we have a blog. And yeah. every, everything we put on our blog, we actually vet it. I mean, we don't, it doesn't go through peer review, but we don't put it up there unless we're okay with it. Is that yeah, and so you'll you'll reach a huge audience, and it's, it's another form of publishing, and do it, but be professional about it. Don't go on like a rant cussing out, you know, your advisor because he said something. <clears throat> that is only going to hurt your career. But if you want to publish stuff that's semi academic -y, you know, just sort of thoughts or research and stuff, yeah. it's probably not going to hurt you. And in fact, you might make uh, relationships with people coming and making comments and being like, well, you know, I actually think this, or have you read this? And you actually sort of start to build a community. So, honestly, a blog, you get a thousand words a day, and you'll actually reach a lot of people, and you can help your career in many other ways. It's not, you'll never really be able to put it on your academic CV. It may be changing. I know some people put it I on their You can't put it in your annual report, yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it would depend on your, who you're applying to, is whether they, I mean, they, they may not count for as much on the CV, but a lot of people, I think, want to see it. I mean, yeah. if you've yeah. done it, you don't. And then, okay, some places would say, don't, we don't want to see it at all. Don't even put it. Then that, I hope yeah. that's changing. Yeah, it's, very, it's changing. It's being more acceptable. And it's, it's not like anyone will see a blog and say, let's toss this CV. Um, they might look at it. And again, that goes back to professionalism. Yeah. If you have good content on there, and it's relevant. So don't have a blog about cats. No one cares about that. But if you have, like, let's say you're interested in, you know, Paleo-Indian stuff, and you have a lot of Paleo-Indian stuff. Yeah. That actually shows that you could write, that you're interested, that you're connected, that you're commenting. Um, it can go a very long way. I know some people who've been hired because they have blogs, or have got opportunities just because they have a blog. And as we all know, nothing on the internet goes away. So that's why you have to be careful, especially when you're representing your professional self. I mean, when I get someone's uh, book proposal or you know I see who's contributing to it I go and look at the people and I find out you know look at their university site or their look professional the site page. I don't go to Facebook but you know your employer will probably find your Facebook page yeah. uh, and you know lots of people get burned that way but I go and I look what they've published I look at their CVs where have they published uh, if they have a blog I go and look at it so people are looking at your professional self uh, wherever you put it in the public sphere in the uh, research sphere, 
people are looking at what you're writing, so yeah. And you can keep a blog private for the first couple of months while you find your voice. I mean, you don't have to like suddenly yeah. be brilliant and put it out there. There's <laughs> ways to sort of dip your toe in there. Or um, community archaeology has a blog. You can you can go and blog for other people and sort of test out these different things um, and see if these digital mediums are something that you like, enjoy. I mean, you might not enjoy blogging at all, and so don't do it. It's not yes. like there's other ways to write a thousand words a day. You can. I mean, Twitter is another medium. I mean, it's a much smaller. You're laughing at me, stop. <laughs> it's a much smaller, you know, it's 140 characters, but it is. Can you say it? Yeah, well, you know what? That's why you have a link to something else. Maybe you're tweeting about your own blog, maybe you're tweeting about this article that you read, but you're still getting your opinion out there, even though it's a very short medium. Um, and it is part of what a lot of people do. I mean, I follow a lot of people on Twitter going to their blogs. I follow a lot of academic, uh, like Scientific America. I follow their tweet, uh, their Twitter account. And so I get a lot of information from Twitter in, you know, my, my own personal Twitter account. And I have a professional Twitter account and that I get a lot of information from following certain people in Twitter on my professional account that I retweet. Um, you know, and it is again forming a community and uh, it's a way to get the information out there that maybe you don't follow this blog, but this is how you're going to find the blog because somebody retweeted about this. So it's another thought, it's another presence that you're putting out there of your professional self that it doesn't really take a lot of work to set up a Twitter account. It doesn't take up very many, much uh, effort to set up a Twitter account. It doesn't take that much effort for you to go on Twitter and retweet something that sounds interesting because it's still representing what you think is interesting. Uh, you don't even have to write a lot of it. It's just you retweeting to your followers something you find interesting. And to sort of segue off of that, um, possibly something we may want to touch on is publishing is no longer you drop off the manuscript and that's it. Um, you do kind of have to do some self-promotion, and Twitter is one way to do that. Yeah. Links, Facebook, I mean, meetings like this, you get it out there, but... So, I track archaeology journals. There's over 200 journals that you can publish in English language in archaeology. That's, no one can read all of that, um, and it's only growing. The, the number of journals, if you look at the start, it's exponential. A couple of years, you know, we could be looking, in a couple of decades, we could be looking at 500 journals. No one's going to read all that. You're going to find your paper different ways, you're going to find it through Google and stuff like that, but a lot of it is going to be, you know, go to Paleo Indian Facebook page and say, hey, I just published this if you guys want to read it. Um, preferably if it's open access, so people can actually read it from the Facebook page. But, you know, there's different ways, and you do have to start thinking about having a Twitter account so you can start prom promoting your article once it gets out there. Because it's <laughs> with digital, everything's changing, and it's not as much as. Used to, you know, it used to be you could get SHA or you know, SAA, and that was the only journals we ever needed in the 50s and 60s, and a couple of regional ones. It's not the 50s and 60s anymore. There's, there's a lot of diversity. Uh, so, given that uh, some of us in the discipline may be working um, on historical research uh, whose descendants are still around and living, what types of considerations should they have for these more unofficial mediums of Twitter or Facebook? Or in terms of clearances and stuff like that? Right, or what, what should they just keep in mind when doing that sort of work? We actively solicit those kind of pieces, so shall I jump in first? Um, it's, an, it's, it's an issue. We have to have, we have, so far we have relied on the author's sense of ethics. We don't, we, we do require releases on photographs that, that are, that are um, not in the, or things are not in the public domain. The, 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 you know, if you're out, if you attend an archaeology site tour, then we're following the sort of general guideline that, that you might have your picture taken. And we don't ask for photo releases for everybody who's in it. Um, but in terms of descendant, and, and the ethics in terms of descendant, <coughs> descendants groups and, and the descendant people, um, it's case by case, but I, you know, I always ask permission. Do you, I'm going to just jump in, and do you um, ask for proof of an IRB? No. And the reason why is because IRBs are not consistently applied overseas at all. What is an IRB? Uh, interest, internal. Uh, internal so, so anytime you do, anytime you do oral histories or any kind of ethnographic work, you're actually working with um, and getting data from, right? And that's that's sort of the key piece, right? You're getting, you're gleaning data from that you're going to be using in your research. Um, 
a living person, you are technically doing research on human subjects, right? And so, um, for most um, institutions of a higher ed would then require, and if they most in the U.S. in the U.S. But uh, but but we're seeing it more and more um, in in especially in European countries. It's turning up, and it's and it's it. It's going to be more and more broadly applied. I, I think less going away, more more coming. We're going to be seeing it because of many of these kinds of issues. Um, and so um, you have to go through an internal review uh, to work with and do research on human subjects. And so um, I, it's not the policy um, of, of our journal, but it is a policy, for example, um, with the manuscripts that I get in um, for SHA and co-pubs. Um, you know, if you're talking about stuff that involves human subjects, I'm going to ask you to show me proof of your IRB. But the, there are, I mean, the, there, there are, are there for are example, the oral history, right. because I did, I did my master's and I had an IRB because I was, my master's with, was with a U.S. institution. My doctorate was with the University of Cambridge, and when I first asked the question, they were like, no, you don't have to do it. But I, I mean, I personally got permission, but I didn't have the IRB review process. And so, uh, and as you say, perhaps that's changing. Um, but um, um, but I think that that it, it would be it would be good just to be aware of it and make certain that you're that you're meeting the ethical guidelines of the university, obviously, and um, and personally. But it doesn't. Do you think? Do you, I don't. I don't sense that it's moving. That more and more new, uh, global universities are requiring it. Are, I, I'm starting to okay. see it more and more, um, in part because people are asking the question. So, for example, um, you know, I've had a number of, of submissions over the last, I don't know, year and a half or so that involved an awful lot of, of, of ethnography or ethnographic techniques just in local communities mm -hmm. gathering data. And I would not have published them had they not been able to show me proof. And two of them um, were in foreign countries. Well, one of the issues, though, too, that the oral, you probably know, the oral History Association has been Negotiating with the, with the, uh, the, the, and I forget the name of the, the entity that, that uh, sort of manages the IRB process. I mean, there is an entity, and I've looked it up in the past, and I can't remember now what it is. But the Oral History Association got a dispensation that oral histories did not have to apply. There are, there, so, are, there are very yeah. notable exceptions, however, and you have to know what they yeah. are. And you have to know what they are. Possibly. Possibly. Absolutely. Oh, I should have said that. Yeah. Yeah. For the, for the grad students in the room, um, outside of the conversation of publishing, if you're going to talk to living people, go to the IRB at your university, because all the universities have them, and ask. Yes. Because if yes. the answer is no, you're okay, it is lightning fast, and you're clear, and you go let them say you're okay. Well, it's not always lightning fast, and I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, well, I know. No, because the expedite, expedite review. Because, like, so the, your dispensation is like, you know, if you're going to do a journalistic study, it's expedited review. And if your IRB is doing their job, it is a, it's an email. Um, if you need a full review, it's a, long, it's a much longer process. But the, the flip side of this is don't worry about publishing. It's when you turn your master's thesis or your dissertation in, yeah. whether or not they kick it back and say, OK, that's nice, start over again. Well, you're because if you don't have an IRB and it's required, they will make you, your data doesn't count. Your right. data is invalid. Right. Um, and right. so it just, I think it's worth, because I mean, I used to go to of saying that there's, there's caveats and there's, exceptions and all that kind of stuff, but it's, if you're going to put four years in some data collection, it's worth doing that ahead of time. And that comes back to that whole ethics question, right? We're doing research using human subjects. It, it needs to be part of the conversation that we're having back to that, that issue about, you know, what are we as, if, you know, in these universities and programs helping our, our students to understand how we engage in those types of, in, in that kind of research. And it is, it is varied, and it is different from one country or region to the to the next. But there are a whole set of just basic ethical standards that are broadly applied. I would argue, and I would argue uh, uh, um, from another perspective that if we are at, and again, this is perhaps just a function of what we're doing is when we are trying to get people to reflect upon their experience in working with a community or in a, in a community here at San Heritage Session, there is really no realistic way for them to implement an IRB. Uh, process with a lot of the reflections they will then want, I want them to report. In other words, it's not a matter of saying that Sally Smith said so and so. Yes, that's that's another clear to clear cut situation. But I'm wanting people to reflect upon the process of working with that community and what they learned from it. And and I would argue that's a that, very different thing. Though. But uh, but I've had people, you know, 
ask the question that you're asking. So I, you, I, you have to be aware of your context and follow the rules of your context and your ethical rules of your, of your, of your discipline. So we'll put it right here. Well, so tweeting and these other forms are relatively new, so what advice would you give to people who would like to have a blog or a Twitter announcement about some of these things? I think technology has only made it easier, but it hasn't changed the underlying ethical dilemma. So um, if, if your group of people you're working with have asked you not to post photos, don't post yeah, yeah, Facebook just makes it easier to post photos, but it hasn't changed that ethical right, dilemma. No. And I can't think of too many change. Like I can't think of a way that Twitter or Facebook or anything like that has created a new ethical dilemma. Um, I, for the most part, it's just made it easier to violate ethics if you wanted to, yeah. but it hasn't changed. And I think the underlying yeah. ones are the same. It makes it easier to find you if you violate it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Be aware of that. <laughs> All right, and then Carol, something you said early on um, really should record with me the fact that you, in retrospect, wish that you had published more of your items as single authors or in journals. Not no, in journals. Right. Um, so <coughs> would you say that having a line on your CV is maybe less important than the citation? I'm sorry? Would you say that having a line on your CV of publication would be less important than the medium in which it's published in? Would you wait for a backlog to get a more prestigious position of publication that would be cited with a wider audience? No, I would think that if I have an opportunity to publish, it's likely to like publish it. But <clears throat> in retrospect, I just think there were a couple of articles that turned out to be really perhaps important. Okay, there are a couple of articles that were more substantive that I find that people go, wow, or I wish that that had gotten out there more. And I wish at the time, since I was pretty new at the game back when this happened, it's like, and they were perfectly okay edited volumes. But for example, there was a European volume that I think, and it was a, I really was proud of the paper. It really established my ethos for the subsequent 15 years of work. I laid it all out in this paper, <clears throat> and it's a European publisher, and I think there were maybe three people who bought the book. So, you know, if it had been through a Springer, for example, it probably would have had a lot more distribution. So that would be one question to ask, perhaps, is as you make that decision, where you want to invest your time in what you're writing, is fine if if, it, if the publisher is, is somewhat more obscure, find out about distribution. What are they going to do to promote your book or to pro promote the volume? And at the time, I was just so happy to be asked to join the party that I wanted to join the party, and I did it. But in retrospect, that article, I really wish had gotten out there. That prestige only really matters in sort of an academic sense. So if, you're, if your goal is just to get something out there, network and stuff like that, go with the journal that's going to target your target audience or the widest reach, something like that. Um, the triple A's did a study of anthropology departments and only like a third required for tenure, this is only for tenure, required certain journals. And they, they laid out what those certain journals were. Yeah. And so there are some departments, but right now if you're if you're looking for an academic job, you have you have no control. You you will be applying to wherever there is a job and that department may and it's whoever's on the committee, they may be like well, they didn't publish in American Antiquity, we're not looking at them. You can't control that. that it, it, you, there's no way you're going to be able to control that, and there's no way you could actually call up every university. It, it'll be maddening to be like, so what's your requirements? Um, usually that doesn't happen a lot in hiring, but I'm sure you know it depends on your hiring committee. And for the most part, two-thirds of anthropology departments don't require you publish in certain venues. So you can publish wherever you want for tenure. Um, but you're not going to be able to control. And some universities, I've heard some universities where they're just like, if you didn't publish in these journals, you didn't publish. And that's there's certain departments that are like that. Um, and it's there's you run the whole gambit yeah. for people who really care about where you publish, and people are like, we're just happy you're publishing. Yeah, publication is a publication. <laughs> yeah, so you can't control that. Why is this peer reviewed? Right. Right. If right. you're in academics. It's peer reviewed. You're, you're pretty good. It, it's hard to go wrong with a peer reviewed journal article. Um, uh, other departments like history, they want a book before you get tenure. It's not so much in, in anthropology. Uh, although having a book is, is a good thing. Uh, so, but yeah, stick with the peer reviewed stuff uh, uh, to to get uh, hired, promoted, tenured, that sort of thing. Uh, but it doesn't preclude doing the other stuff. I I, I think they're both good.
question? I do, yeah. It's kind of related to this. Um, I, one of the things that I've noticed within the last few years, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with how publications are rated on your CV, et cetera, you know, your impact factor and things like that. And I've kind of noticed a watershed within our faculty between some that put more emphasis on big, large, meaty, several year um, projects that they publish all in kind of one go in one major article as opposed to more or less the same information that you would publish over a period of five to six years in several different small articles. Um, what are, what are y'all's opinions on that in terms of what works well? How are you seeing that kind of flesh out? Are there good things and bad things about those approaches? I, I, I think you see the full gamut of that. And I think that, again, that's a lot department-based. I, I don't necessarily think it's either or. I think you should do both, yeah. publish all along. Uh, if you've got a big 10-year project, you publish as you go along, and then you publish the big book at the end. So many times I've seen colleagues that I'm going to wait until it's all done before I publish, and it yeah, never gets, gets done. Right. And everybody knows right, that's what's right. going to happen. So uh, I think, gosh, get more bang for your money, get some publications along the way, and then a big one at the end. And it probably should be based on what the project is, what yeah. works the best. So if, if, it, if you have something that works best in a book, go with a book. If it works best in a journal, go with a journal. But um, I, I do run into a lot of people be like, no, I'm going to wait for a book because they think that's more prestigious or they want their name on a book. Those are not mutually exclusive. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, how you frame the article and what you do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Lots of people do, you know, sort of edited books with peer-reviewed articles and get permissions from the, the publishers. Uh, Assuming, and I think one of the things, to be honest, one of the things that I'm finding really interesting about this panel discussion is there's a lot of talk about a, a blog and a Twitter and a this and a that, and suddenly I, I'm really impressed that people have time, quite frankly. Like, how do you have time, you know? Yeah, yeah, if you're going to do the small publications and then the book, and then you're going to do the external. Yeah, do, and do the what I say you don't do what it's I really, <laughs> To be honest, I just don't know if anyone sleeps. Um, because I think that's, I mean, ultimately, as a student coming in, I think that's part of what makes it so intimidating is, A, trusting yourself as, as, as an expert, as an authority that can't publish on something. And, and be the idea of when you finish it. Well, when do you get it done in addition to all Right, I think what we're, we're telling you is, yeah, a blog's a good idea, you've got that, but honestly, do not let that get in the get way. Get in the way of your peer review That's because I've had since my, well, I, I would have given you my thesis chapter, but I was working on my blog. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Give me what I need. And it's not. If you do a blog right, it actually helps. So yeah, I've I've had articles that have been published that were eventually a series of yeah. blog posts. Yeah. And so I need I had a big idea. Right. I didn't want to knock it out all at once. You can't do that in a blog. It's like 500 words. And the, the final piece was very different. The blog was a first draft. You were working through ideas. Yeah, a pre-first draft. So you can work. You can use a blog to work through ideas and practice. Get a thousand words a day or five hundred or get feedback on and, it. And let me, yeah. let me bring and then, on that thousand words a day. When Brian Fagan said that to me, I said, "Yeah, right. Like I can do a thousand damn words a day. I don't. I mean, I, I publish well, but I, I don't do a thousand words a day. But it's the point is, if you write something and get it and make it be a habit, that's what he was saying. And, you know, we're all none of us are like Brian Fagan. Who have, <laughs> cranked out things or something like that. But the point is, if you can write a little bit on a regular basis, uh, that gets you in the mode. And then you, you're not stuck with writer's block every time you have to do something. And a blog might not be the best. Yeah. Uh, see, the, the advantage of a blog is you share your work, and it gets out to other people, and you make connections. It's another way of publishing. But maybe your ideas and how you write stuff up doesn't work for a blog at all. So don't do it. I mean, this is not to say, this is not one size fits all. Yeah. No, um, of course not. And it, but if you do a blog write, it basically, you're taking that same writing and it's your first draft of many drafts. Um, but it doesn't take that much more time out of your, and it has advantages. But again, it's not for everyone. I mean, hopefully from what everybody in this pan of this room would take away is getting you thinking about the way that you can get your work out there. And this, I think what we're exploring is there's so many different ways now that you can do it. And it's not just a journal article and it's not just a book chapter. And what works for you and what maybe your mentor advises you can do and what works for your life. I think that's what you really have to kind of let all these things kind of sift through and say, I can do this, but I really don't feel comfortable doing that. That's fine. Do what, and one of the other things, too, is um, try and figure out what's available to you, right? You know, so for, for example, let me put my other, other hat online, my SHA hat, so if you're on or at SHA, right? 
So SHA um, has a Help Publications program. That's a benefit of your membership, right? You know, if you don't know what that is, find out about it. You know, the gist of it is it's an opportunity for you to take a master's thesis, a, a dissertation, um, or just this wonderful monograph that through a series of blogs, you've finally gotten it, you know, all together, right? And then submit it to me at, at SHA, and there's the potential of going through the process where, you know, your work can get selected and be endorsed carry the logo of the SHA plus the co-publication press partner, whether they be academic press or non-academic we have a whole host of academic pre of press partners. Um, you know, and for young scholars especially, um, you know, looking to start in, in academia in particular and, and, and I go through all of that process, we, do, we, we don't do a lot of them, right? But it's a benefit of membership. So if the SHA or the ACWA, because we do these with both organizations, you know, your 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 work is selected and, and it gets that endorsement and that logo is on that work. That's very prestigious. That is huge, folks. It's huge. You now I probably have 25 manuscripts on my desk at any given time that have come through this process for SHA. Um, and you know, we spend an awful lot of time. I've got associate editors sitting in this room right here, and they they mentor you through that process of getting that first big publication, whatever that happens to be. It's, it's it, there's there's huge value in that, and you're not going to get it from the presses. You know, the the trend right now um, for those you know submitting a first book, whether it be based on a dissertation or independent monograph or whatever, is you know there's going to be no royalties and no support, zero. You are untried. It's a gift to the press to select you and that's enough. That's a huge change in the in the industry in terms of publishing um, on the academic side. But the other side of that is that you know if selected and, 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 and run through that SHA process, you're gonna get a lot of mentorship. Um, you know, a lot of things come with that. So, and it's not just here. Other, other active, uh, other societies and programs, and you know, around the country, even your regionals might have similar opportunities. You need to ask and find out. You know, what are some of the other benefits of my membership to be part of things like this too? So, know that, know that. And to rehash, just um, just for the other side, not academic, uh, go through that as well. It Absolutely. has an advantage. Um, so, I'll, I'll talk from like a CRM standpoint. A publication can act as like a business card. I, I've, we've worked with people who we've never met, but because we've read their publications, we know they are competent and they could write. Um, and you should always, even if you're not going to go the academic route, and statistically speaking, you have a better chance of dying of cancer than getting tenure <laughs> uh, in archaeology. That's most of you. <laughs> yeah, a bit depressing, I know. <laughs> but it's not that bad, really. <laughs> Most most of you are not most of you are not going to be able to get an academic job, so it still has a huge well, advantage. Is true. Absolutely, <laughs> and 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 to the, to that point, we very specifically made sure that the co-publications program has a a very broad <coughs> base of things you can do with it, including um, two different presses that we can do case studies with. Those are great for folks that are wanting to think about or are planning to go into the CRM world. It's a fabulous, fabulous way to do that and really craft the writing skill, have that book out that's based on something that is useful within the field that you, you can envision yourself to go to. So. So do a book review. You get a free book and a publication. <laughs> All right, so uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. In before we wrap up for questions, is there any, I guess, given what we've discussed, one tidbit of advice that you would like to offer as we end things here? Right, right, right. <laughs> Practice, yeah, and just take take advantage of opportunities, and and, and think outside the box. Something comes along, you may be able to do something with it. You just never really consider it because it's not necessarily the mainstream. But be creative, be innovative. Follow the. Um, all of that's true, but when you actually do make contact with an, with an editor, follow their guidelines, meet their deadlines, and that sounds, but a lot of people don't. And if you do, then you will be seen as a professional, even if you will be seen as a professional. And, I'll, and believe me, we remember who screwed up. <laughs> I don't know. You know, we got, we got that paper from her three years ago, and she never did turn it. You know, she took her to eight, you know, a whole year. 
We remember. People remember. Yeah, go ahead and uh, be courteous. Be courteous to your the editors. And if you're doing peer review, be courteous. Even if it's anonymous, don't need to tear people apart. That's true. We haven't talked about that at all. Yeah, no, just yeah. Say, well, along those lines, my advice will be don't take it personally. Yeah. You know, if somebody's critiquing your work, uh, even if they're being mean spirited, and, 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 and there are some, we try not to let that get through. We'd say, yeah. every time, you know, lighten up a bit, just tell them why you disagree. Yeah. But even if it yeah. seems that, and honestly, you're going to be so touchy about what you're writing <laughs> that right. well meant criticism, you'll, but they, they think I'm stupid. No, they don't. Well, maybe you do, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, just don't take it personally. Address their comments and move forward. You know, in in, in that vein, you know, um, the folks that are doing reviews, um, and, and hopefully those mean spirited ones, you know, they're they're truly not the norm. They're they're truly not the norm. But keep in mind that you know a lot of work and time and effort went in on the review side as well, and that the. the you know, take the comments, and hopefully they're very constructive in the spirit in which they were given, right? The purpose of external review of anything, whether it be your blog, getting comments, or a journal article, a book, or anything else, is to make your work better, to be part of the professional community. So sometimes you just have to take a deep breath, step back, and, and, and think about those things. But remember, there, there's time and effort and scholarship on the back side of it, too, that's meant to make you better. And, and, and you know, building up from what both of you said, I think if you do get a review back on a piece and you really just don't agree, for whatever reason, perhaps the reviewer misread your work, perhaps you feel like that's going to be addressed in another paper, whatever it is, it's often possible if you work with the editor, it's often possible to address the comment without making this. You can oftentimes say, this is beyond the scope of this paper, for example. You know, sometimes, a lot of times reviewers will say, well, I think they should go into this and this and this and this, because this, that's what I want to see. Well, yeah. you know, so, yeah. and so working with your editor as a collaborator, just if there's something you don't want to address for what, not because it, you're, you know, irritated, but because you just simply think it's outside the scope of what you want to do, you can address it by saying that. So there are ways to, so look at it as a reciprocal process. Yeah, there's, Again, with learning how to write, learn how to do peer review. Um, uh, usually, it tends to be a thrown there by the fire, you know, you trial by error, and learn because peer review is meant to try. So I look at peer review. It's maybe not how everyone looks at it. Is to make the best final product possible. And so, but some people look at it as, you know, they're trying to keep out bad science, and you probably are never going to get the editors will catch papers that are like. Stonehenge made by aliens. That's, that's not gonna. That's not gonna go to peer review. Unless it's Katie Arkell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, but like you're not. You're usually your purpose is not usually to try to keep out bad science. Your purpose is trying to make the best science possible or the best outcome. And you're not trying to be there. Don't try to be snotty or you know try to cut people down and stuff like that. Look at their argument. And this is something that's not usually taught: is how to make their paper the best paper possible. And because you, you'll get various and you know various feedback from peer review, you'll get something that'll be like, "Good article, make minor changes," but they don't tell you what those minor changes are. Uh, you know, yeah, you'll get a lot worse than <laughs> ones that'll be like, "It looks good, maybe mention this," but that's all I'll say. And then you'll get ones that people will spend like six pages, and those I'm are alive. brilliant. Um, and they'll go through, and basically, they should probably be a co-author on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the reviews I love. Because I'll get two reviews back, one will be like, it looks great, and I'll get one that's pages that I need to make changes. And I prefer, even though the one that said looks great, get published, is great, I prefer the one that actually spent a lot of time. And, and they you know they, read it care they took it seriously. Yeah. And on the other side of that, I, got, I have been known to go to authors who submitted and ask them for peer reviews of other people later. Oh. And so if, if and when you're asked to do peer review, whatever stage of your career that you're asked to do it, and it's oftentimes fairly early on, especially depending on what kind of work you're doing and what kind of specialty you have, it serves to the discipline. You don't get any money for it. You oftentimes nobody knows who you are, except for the editor who's grateful to for your time. But it's really, it's, you see what's out there, you see what the right, and, and, and it's, a, it is a gratifying thing sometimes to do it. And so you'll be hopefully spending time doing that. So when some people ask you, say yes. 
We, I'm going to put my little spinner head on. We actually have on our website Peer Review Academy. So it's actually kind of going step by step about how to be a good peer reviewer and not just say, it, you know, it needs improvement or to be very specific. Uh, and there's a little quiz at the end of it. I took a quiz. I've got a 90. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you're like, duh, of course I need to do that. But it's good to have it also spelled out for you about this is how to be a good peer reviewer. Find resources like that about writing. Find resources about that about how to be a peer reviewer. Find resources like that about how to do a good book review. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, going back to, it's a big, internet world, there's a lot of resources out there for you. You can find them easily enough through Google. And to Carol's point, you know, if, if, if you get through an article or a book with me, you're on my list forever. If you made it through that, you bet you're going to be on that review list. So you say no once, I'll be okay if you say no to me twice, and then you submit another journal article to me. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I don't know, where'd that go? <laughs> and so this also might be a personal choice, but some people are now signing, if it's anonymous, they'll sign their reviews. And that's not for everyone. That is personal choice. Yeah. I personally do it because it holds me to a higher standard. It means they know my name and I better be giving and then them And you're the, not going to make an ad hominem type of thing. Yeah, I better be giving them the, because it's, it's now another piece of work yeah. they're judging me by. Yeah. Um, so I sign all my anonymous or ask the editor. Some, you know, occasionally a journal will be like, no. It's Ours is default no line, but if people want to have their name released, that's fine. Yeah, so you, yes, I asked the editor if I can have, if they can send it, if they want to contact me about comments. But that kind of, it's a good way to hold you to a really high standard of doing a review. Because um, then I don't send the, oh, looks great, a couple of typos. <laughs> um, but honestly, if you're starting out and you're asked to review something of a, of a senior scholar, oh, yeah, it yeah, might not be in your best interest yeah. to yeah. say, yeah. this yeah. stinks, and I said so. Uh, I've had reviewers go, you know what? You better not ever tell them to put my name out there. You know? Yeah, like I said, you know, and the reason they're blind is yeah. so we get more candid, yeah. uh, you know, so that someone says, well, then they're just going to come after me yeah. later. You know, and, and honestly, that doesn't happen often, but it does happen occasionally. But if you're reviewing something, you have some comments, and you know, and, and, and you know the author, and, and, and as you go along, you will get to know these people because they're working on the same stuff you are. Um, Say, so yeah, this is this is different. And a lot of times, the author can kind of figure out who it is anyway, yeah. but the comments. But uh, you say, yeah, and, and then they can contact me directly, and I'll you know explain more about what I was thinking. So we've covered a, a wide variety of topics. We had a preset list of questions that we ran off of. Is there anything that we maybe didn't touch on that you'd like to ask about that? I have a question in terms of balancing. Like, say you have you know, a book project idea and a couple article ideas. So how do you balance and prioritize you know, what, where you put your energies in and focus first? So say you have def, you know, several things in the fire. How would you go about you know, strategically managing those? And, you know, if you're working towards tenure, you want to get the ones that'll get through the pipeline quickest in there, so that you have stuff coming out. I mean, you may have the great, fabulous book project, but if you're rejected for tenure before that book gets out, and you say, no, just give me a year extension, and that, that doesn't happen. But if you can get a couple of books out while you've got the, the uh, a couple of articles out while you got the book percolating in the back, uh, that that's what I would do. And ask that question when you're talking to publishers. How long, you know, what's the pipeline with and editors? You know, you don't have to dance with the first person to ask you. And it, it'll differ from like sort of self-discipline. So if you're more in the history or looking to work in the history department, a book is yeah, going right. to be you, you have to. Yeah, and, and you want to get going on that run. Right even in archaeology, we have very sub-disciplines. That so osteology and zoology, there's very few. There's like textbooks, but there's actually very few books. It's almost all articles. So check out and ask ask questions. I there's lots of areas of archaeology I have no clue about, and my advice would be generic. So go and see if like a book is what you need, or also overseas it might be different. So is that most places, like the UK doesn't technically have tenure, um, and so you don't have to really worry about the time thing, but you have the ref, which is every five years, um, which I would say is worse than having to do tenure, because it's tenure every time, every five years, but you probably want to have that book out in time for the ref. And it depends five. on the field you're publishing in, too. My dissertation was on the internet and archaeology, and I you know, did the analysis in 98 and, you know, graduated in 2002. By 2004, it was completely out of date. 
So if I had had, I mean, I didn't do a book. I just, people say, why didn't you do a book? Well, yeah, it's a Paleolithic of internet time. You know? <laughs> Five years from the day I did it. I think there were still some findings that were relevant, by the way, but you know, it was before blogs and all that stuff. So to landscapes change. So it depends on your topic. You have, you have to decide. Is it something that needs to get out there because it won't be relevant in five years? Or is it something that's got a little bit longer shelf life? Take articles and stuff based on that. I, you do need to take it on a case by case basis and really think about what you know, what is it your what's your end goal? That's the other thing. You know, I had a young scholar comment sit down with me yesterday. We had this very conversation, right? You know, I, I I'm in the process, I'm almost finished with my PhD, but I've also got this master's thesis and I know I really need to do some journal articles. What should I be doing, right? Um, I had a question about like uh, when you get reviews back, and um, I know at least I, I've never had something that's gone out to peer review, but I, I've had several people do the the like you said, sending them out to friends of certain papers or whatever. It's, um, I've had a certain friend like I really like your voice and how you do this, and another friend go, I think you need to be more professional about how you do this, and like how do you? How do you suggest we deal with that? And how do you guys deal with that? When do you guys like look at the reviews when they come in before you send them out? No. To the so you know, one of the things that I I highly recommend because I get that question often too. Before you submit to any any whatever that you're you're doing in any of those 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 formats, go read that thing yes. first, right? Because. Right. This journal has this type of stylistic bent, and this one has has this one over here, right? Go and read the things that have been recently published by whatever that is, whether it's the newspaper, it's a magazine, it's a regional journal, whatever, um, because that will give you the sense, right, of what the finished product that made it all the way through, what what style that they're really looking for, because that's a question beyond just the basic technical guidelines, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we have a we have a what we are about page, and we have our style guide. Two different things. And the what we are about it says this is what we're trying to do. If you want to write for us, you need to do this. Yeah. I'm, this I'm, is I'm talking about going and actually reading, reading, the yeah, yeah. Right. reading, yeah. Yeah. read yeah. articles yeah. from that from that journal. Yeah. You're going to get a really good sense of you know what some of that's going to be. And, and honestly, always be professional. If you know, for example, you try to uh, publish at the store of archaeology, you get three reviews back. Uh, and two are really positive, and they like this. But one says, "No, I, you know, I don't like the way this is written." Usually, if the editor's on top of it, they'll see that there's, you know, two positive views and one's negative, and they'll try and figure out, okay, they they will give you some advice. Yes, yeah. you've got these negative comments. We, you know, we're passing these on to you, but honestly, we think these other two reviews are spot on with that. Look at some of the the ideas yeah. in the other one, but they'll, they'll give you advice. So yeah. you shouldn't get. Conflicting reviews back, and then you well, what? What the heck? Yeah, you know, well, 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 it's like turning in your thesis yeah, or dissertation, yeah. and one person on your yeah. committee is being a jerk from <laughs> and everything. But that it's the same sort of thing. Chair of your committee then should step in and say, "Okay, this is how we're going to do it," and the editor will. will yeah. Be the now, most staff. editors will actually make recommendations. I mean, I'm not gonna. I will not send reviews back to an author and it says, "Here they are." You know, this is my decision. Um, it's, it's really going to be, um, you know, if, if these are the recommendations, if these are the components of the reviews that I want you to pay attention to, these are the things that didn't get mentioned but I need you to address. So a good editor is actually going to give you a fair amount of feedback that will help you make some of those directional decisions. Right. I would have two pieces of advice. One is, before you sit down, get in the frame of mind that it's going to come back in the worst possible shape. So when it comes back, halfway there, you're just happy. <laughs> um, and the other is read your reviews, put them down, and then come back a week later. That's exactly the way. Right. Yeah. Step away because you're all you're too upset. <laughs> you talk yourself <laughs> off the ledge and then come back. <laughs> but, but even if they're great reviews, put them down and walk away. Yeah. yeah. You. I, I mean, I'm very lucky right now. I just got some reviews back. And I was able. I'm at the conference. I could say, I can't do it right now. But I've, I've, I've learned the hard way. I got back a review that basically said. Um, this person has no idea about CRM, which personally really hurts. And so I got very angry and wrote to the editor. I was like, I don't agree with this. And then the editor calmed me down and obviously did not pass along my comments to the reviewer. <laughs> um, don't do what I did. Um, just, yeah, put it down and you can come back to it. And they're, they're not expecting you to have it back in an hour with all the changes. Um, 
Unless, of course, you've not missed the deadline, <laughs> <laughs> in which case they will expect you back in if you want to be anywhere near your being public. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, along those lines of reading the journal that you want to publish in, uh, when I was preparing my article for Islam Archaeology, I read, uh, and, and I get the journal and I read it from cover to cover, but I went back and read through a few issues just to identify what I like, what I don't like, as far as format, style just basic organization of an article. So not just you know figuring out what the article is about, but figuring out what you like about that journal, yeah. what you see in that you want to emulate. I wouldn't understand if you would submit to a journal that you've never read an article from. Yeah. That would be strange to me. It sounds strange to me. It happens all the time. It does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, if you had, I don't. and if you submitted before and been Sorry. turned down, and you know, I think transparency is always a good thing. Yeah, and don't don't submit articles to more than one journal at the same time. Yes. Oh, yes. Do not do that. It's incredibly unprofessional. Um. So, in kind of along those lines, I want to ask a question about you know, state, regional, and national journals. How do you make a decision as far as where to put your article? first or where to put your article at all? Again, I think it depends on the you know, situation and, and what your end goal is. So that's why I, I started with what is it that you're trying to accomplish, right? And so, you know, if, if, if you're working in CRM and that particular um, article is, is, has a real regional application and if you're doing the greatest service to the field and, and, and to the public by putting it in that regional journal, then, then that's the best place for it to be. And it's as prestigious as anything else because it's the right place for it. Um, so, you know, I would suggest that you really step back and think about what is it that you're trying to accomplish with this thing? What, what do I need to do? And uh, you may have some, like, in, in, in academia, you may have some of these, uh, you know, tenure or whatnot requirements. You need to know those and, and, and play to those. But at the end of the day, it, I, I would argue it's really about, you know, what's in the best interest of that thing? What are you trying to accomplish? Who's your audience? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to impact? Does it have national application? If it doesn't, then you know, and it has it has greater use and and life, mm -hmm. right? Then then put it someplace else. Or if it has national, not every article has to do everything. Absolutely. So you may have, say, your dissertation or your thesis. I mean, you should get a bunch of articles from each one of those documents. You know, and, and they can all be targeted, still drawing on your same body of research, right? But you're just going this way with that one. It's, it's, and and, you know, and the Cook journals will say say you submit something to historical archaeology and it really would be better in SEAC or something. They might come back and say, you know, the, it's really not appropriate for what we're doing, but you should look at a regional journal mm -hmm. or we introduce people to other editors sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, but to be really Machiavellian about this, like do your research. So. Look at journals, because everyone just assumes that a journal goes everywhere. Go on WorldCat, and it's not the most accurate. But see what universities actually have that journal. So you could go, you could be in a thing, and you want to target specific people in your field. And it turns out the university doesn't get that journal. Well, it's kind of useless. Um, think about these sort of things. Think about your audience. Uh, back to the cross-disciplinary. So I do a lot of digital archaeology, but it's a local sort of archaeology. And then digital, I can publish in sort of Internet archaeology, or there's a couple of other journals that are very specific to technology. And that depends if I want a job in technology. If I do, definitely, definitely publish in where people read and publish <coughs> local for CRM. And if you want a, a national sort of larger impact, look at a society, so SAA or SHA, because the members get the journal. Because um, you, again, look at the distribution, because some journals. Um, if they you know they're starting out or they're not they're well established they may only go to 50 universities and that might be that's all around the world so um, it doesn't help you if you're never applying for a job in Germany um, if if all the journals are picked up there so you really really do your research and I mean ask people but be careful about getting advice from people because a lot of people pass on the same advice that they've gotten which is oh you should always publish in American antiquity which is a good place to publish, but it may not be the best place to publish. And that advice may be 20 or 30 years old. So just really do your research. 
All right, well, we've um, exhausted our time. I don't know what the plans are in the room after us, but I'd like to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. We've all learned a lot. Thank you all for coming Saturday morning. It's much appreciated after a big social event last night. So uh, thank you all very much. And with apologies to my Springer colleague, here's my journal. <laughs> <laughs>